friendship invitation when you are already friends. In, a, in our system, the friendship relationship is realized as follows. First, Alice invites Bob. This creates a record of the invitation. And Bob may choose to accept an invitation. And if he chooses so, we need to change three things in the data. We have to tell that uh, Bob is a friend of Alice. We have to tell that Alice is a friend of Bob. And finally, we have to get rid of the invitation. Uh, this is not the only way to model this data, but we will, for the purpose of this presentation, assume it's modeled this way. So we have three record, two records representing friendship uh, in both directions. The problem is that because there is not only one operation here, the data may stop being consistent. So Alice may be friends with Bob, but Bob is no longer friends of her. Uh, similarly, Alice can be friends with Bob, and they can see an invitation. Uh, this makes the system speak nonsense to people. So we want to avoid it. 
Well, I presume most of the time you have been working or you are working with SQL databases that provide transactions. When you have a transaction, you simply have the operations to, pr to proceed and then you commit them. The transaction will go as a whole or not at all. Very convenient. But what if you don't have a transaction? Let's say we have a very simple use case, not even a distributed system where you have allow a user to upload a file and have to create a respective database entry for this file. You can handle the situation at least in two ways. You, are, you can either first save the file, then store the relative record in the database, or do the opposite. Assuming it's an application where the user looks at the list of the files he uploaded, and he can, let's say, download them, uh, the one approach will be better than the other. Let's say the system fails between steps one and two. What happens in case A? Uh, file is there in storage, but user no longer does not see it on the list. In case B, he sees him, it, this file on the list, but we try to access it, he sees an error. So given the simple use case, this simple order is important. Uh, when you are going into a distributed system, you no longer have transactional safety. At least not if you are have to resign for SQL databases. And there's a general level term called consistency, availability, toleration to partitioning uh, that has been formulated about 15 years ago by Brewer, Eric Brewer, and then formal grounds have been provided and been proven to be true. And often it states, it's being summarized with cool marketing, uh, saying, these are your three features, choose two. Um, the problem with this theorem is that most of the systems seem not to obey them. We know the systems tend to be consistent, tend to be available, and tend to survive some failures. How does it happen? So, for example, you might refer to Two-Face Comet. Um, in Two-Face Comet, it's an equivalent of a transaction in a, but, but done in a distributed environment. You have one node that's a, called a coordinator, and uh, that's on the left. And on the right, you have other nodes that are participating in that transaction. Uh, it's called a Two-Face Comet because coordinator first asks all of the other servers, whether they can commit to operation. If they can, they will have to do it given the commit command. The problem with two-phase commit is that uh, it's time consuming. It doesn't give you a guarantee your resources will not be locked for a long time. So you are sacrificing scalability, you are sacrificing performance, and eventually availability. Also, it has a single point of failure, that's the coordinator. If it dies in the middle of transaction, well, other servers have to stay locking the resources or have to proceed with an inconsistent data. So, usually uh, when I saw developers so far dealing with such environment, they just write those three operations and don't care. Then I usually ask, what happens when it, it fails between those steps. And that I ask when, not if. It will eventually happen. So what can we do? <coughs> um, we can try to tackle this, but we, before we tackle this, we will, should try to understand a bit more what's CAP theorem and why it not always applies. So CAP theorem, in my opinion, defines availability consistency and toleration to partitioning in a bit weird manner compared to real life systems. For example, availability is defined that any non-failing node results in a handler's request properly. Consistency is not very similar to what we understand for database systems. Uh, it simply says that once you have written some value, 
all further readings of those value must return consistent data. So this example that you are seeing here, when I change old value to new value, uh, I sh when I start reading those, I should always receive the new value regardless which node I'm using. So currently, this simple example so much that system does not consistent. Now, when you go more deep into Capturum, you will find out it's trivially simple. It just assumes a distributed system of at least two nodes, and those nodes can synchronize data between them. And for example, when you write to the node at the top, it synchronizes with the node at the bottom, responds that you have written data correctly, and the system returns proper uh, value regardless from which node you are reading. So this system is consistent, and as long as nothing breaks, it's available. Uh, the problems happen when the link between the nodes is broken. This is uh, what's called in Kappa partition. Then you have to either sacrifice availability or consistency. Uh, if you decide to sacrifice availability, your system will be consistent and partition tolerant. Simply when there's a partition, it's not available. It simply does not accept any writes. If you decide to sacrifice uh, consistency, your system will accept writes, but nodes at the top and node at the bottom will be returning different data, hence not being consistent. Even more challenging is the case where you are considering a system that's both consistent and available but does not tolerate partitions. But that's for, let's say, further part of this presentation. When you're thinking of those nodes, each node in CAP is treated as a whole application. So there's no differentiation which node is database, which node is, let's say, the application server. And if you are thinking of this simple case and try to understand it in the consistent available tolerating partitions uh, conditions, then this system it tolerates partitions because there are no two nodes communicating, so there can be no partition at all. The system stays consistent as long as the database is on, let's say, transactional database. And surprisingly, this is also available because given the definition of availability, every non-failing node provides the traffic. If it's working, it's it handles the traffic. If it's failing, there's no non-failing node that's, um, that's not handling traffic. Usually when thinking of nodes, we are thinking of more complex things. We are thinking how communication contacts with the database, to which databases is contacts, whether those databases are replicated, whether they are, uh, they handle a failover, etc. When we may have also a long balancer there, and so on and so on. So CAP does not go into this detail at all. It means when thinking in CAP terms, there's no, um, no sense in seeking what happens if the connection between database and application server breaks. When you're thinking of databases themselves, well, there are lots of arguments not to treat them as in the CAP sense, but if you try, you may think of a system that has one primary or one master and a set of secondaries or replicas, and you accept rights to the master and reads from secondaries. If the synchronization between the primary and secondary is synchronous one, the system is consistent. If not, if it's asynchronous one, the system is not consistent. Now, when thinking of availability, we have to think of the partition. And now, assuming primary still accepts writes and provides reads, this system will stop being consistent, will be available on both sides of the partition. <coughs> However, if you treat those secondary of failed ones, your system stays consistent and available, assuming we redirect all the traffic to the part on the right. So basically, uh, CAP thinks of a partition as all nodes have to serve data, but if you artificially turn some nodes off, just redirect traffic, you are still fine. 
And usually this is what you do because it's much easier to do this than to actually synchronize data between nodes that have been partitioned for some time. So what those high traffic systems are? They are consistent most of the time. They tolerate partitions or handle them in a smart way. And we tend to have them available all the time, usually on failure happens, so he was a mistake. From a mathematical standpoint, whole system, like whole Facebook or whole Google or whole whatever system you are doing is neither this nor this nor that. Uh, when thinking of them, you rather have to think of parts of the system when you can design them as being either available under partition or consistent under partition, meaning if there's a partition, this part is unavailable. So for example, searching in Facebook when there's a partition might not provide the most up-to-date posts, but it will work. For example, friends list might stop being available. Of course, I don't know if that's the case in Facebook. But um, usually, you should think about just parts of the system to grasp them, how they behave under some circumstances, are they failure or partition. Uh, most of simple systems are consistent and partition tolerant. It's easy to design such system, just single application node and single database. What's hard is to design a system that's available and partition tolerant. And we want our high traffic systems to be highly available. Therefore, we need to design not the most simple solutions. And <clears throat> if we choose our system to be available, but not necessarily consistent, we still need some form of guarantees. And there is such thing, it's called eventual consistency. It says uh, that data is not always entirely up to date when you look at the whole system, when you look at one user's perspective, you pretend the system is always up to date. And the system is actually always, system under high traffic is always under inconsistent state, but it still tries to rush to this consistent state and then ensuring that eventually everything will be the way it should be. Uh, useful approaches to design eventually consistent system is uh, our eventual consistency itself, because we want the system to be available, it cannot be always consistent. And also when it comes to communication, we rather have to seek uh, looser requirements that, for example, a message will be delivered at least once and it will be handled if properly even if it's delivered twice. We should rather seek what's the source of our truth, so what's the source of our knowledge, instead of searching for absolute truth that would be an SQL database. We have to know how system behaves when data is not consistent. And finally, how to return to consistent state, especially after a failure. When thinking of our friends example, there were three operations, Bob being friend of Alice, Alice being friend, friend of Bob, and finally the invitation. Given the simple uh, case when we want to create such a relationship once Bob accepts the invitation, we could, for example, consider different orders, the same way I did for files. So for example, if we decide to de delete the invitation first, then uh, if it fails after step one, then uh, there will be no invitation at all and they will be not friends, as if the invitation wasn't sent at all. If it fails after step two, then Alice will see Bob in friends list, but Bob will not see her in the list. A different order would be to consider showing that Alice is friends of both Bob's first, then Bob sees Alice as, as friends, and that Alice does not see him, and Bob still sees this request he shouldn't be seeing. If it fails after step two, Alice and Bob will see each other as in friends, and uh, Bob is still seeing this request. Let's say the third case is that Bob is accepting the invitation and now if it fails after step one, Alice sees Bob as a friend, but Bob does not see Alice as a friend and Bob sees the request from Alice as if he never accepted this invitation. 
So given the, the simple system, I think those two are the most valuable candidates to, to decide on which order, in which order to apply operations. And I think the first one is slightly better, but this is rather a business decision here. Uh, because in, in the case of the first one, Bob's, Bob still does not see Alice as a friend, but he sees it as if he never accepted the invitation. So we c he can, given properly designed system, uh, fix this issue. Going further, uh, when doing a friendship relationship or when creating, I don't know, any post or tweet, uh, it may happen that I try to create a post and start waiting for the response from the server. Server creates a post, sends a request, and this request does not, re this response does not uh, reach me. And from the perspective of the user, I have no idea whether the post was created or not. What usually do people do? Resend. Question is how the system should behave under it. If it accepts the second request, it will create duplicate posts. And this happens very often when two servers are communicating, and you have to think of making the action idempotent. In maps, idempotent means that doing the same operation on the same data, data twice will result in exactly the same result. Uh, in our case, we want to make sure not only that the result will be consistent in the end, but if it failed in the middle for the first time, it will repair the data running the second time. So for example, if it failed after it added Alice being friends of Bob, then running this operation for the second time, if it's an absurd, not an insert, will simply correct the data. You can also notice the condition at the beginning is laid upon the last thing done in this operations or deletion of the invitation. If this invitation doesn't exist, it has either not been sent at all, or it has been already fully handled. Once we think it may fail, and we accept it may fail, we have to know how the system will behave once such things happen. So we have to know whether the system will behave properly if some natural constraints on data are not met. So we should generally write a contract and have developers know what they are developing against. So you say something must be met, it means it must be always strongly consistent because your system allows for this. And something should be met, meaning it's only eventual consistency, meaning the Proper data, for proper data this is not the case, but the system may be in this state and you have to be prepared to handle this case. Finally, you should be testing against the contract. So the minimal thing you could do is to prepare this inconsistent data and see how the system behaves. Here on the left we have a code for accepting the invitation. So it's creating friends from one day to the other, then from the other way to the the first way, and finally we are moving invitation. While the test creates this data as if it failed after step one, and then reruns the request checking whether it corrected the data. And the other thing you might consider are the more sophisticated things, for example, guys at Netflix, Netflix are doing. <coughs> But you have to usually think about whole functionality and not every system is so simple. So what if I can delete a friend? What if I can cancel up an invitation? What if I can send invitation when I already have an invitation to this person? Etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this planning of proper order operation seems to collapse. So maybe you should think of a more sophisticated approach, like even sourcing where you will have a change log and you will apply this change log to the model that you will read saying whether they are friends or not. Once you have this change log, you can do, for example, the following. At the beginning of the request, you just mark that Bob has accepted the invitation in the log. Then you handle the whole operation and finally you mark the operation as succeeded. If uh, something in the middle of the 
point number two fails, you can simply rerun all the pending operations because the action is important. You will be guaranteed that they will succeed properly. It's more difficult when a partition happens and you want both the node on the left that's partitioned from the node on the right to accept requests. Then you may receive, for example, contradictory request where you have to go into merging and config solving. And this is usually the thing we in IT try to avoid as much as possible because merging and config solving often no, is not trivial. We rather tend to turn off one zone and redirect all the traffic to the other zone. Uh, when thinking of CAP, uh, I've mentioned that the synchronization of data is synchronous, which ensured consistency, but synchronous replication is very slow, especially if one of the replicas would be in the other zone, like one is in Europe, another is in North America. But if it's not synchronous, then we fall into the consistency issues when Bob can accept an invitation and depending on which node he's reading from, they will be friends or they will be not. How to deal with it? For example, you could uh, use a cache. At the beginning, when Bob accepts an invitation, you are writing down to the cache that they are already friends. And uh, when other people or you are asking for this information, it's being read from the cache. If it's not in the cache, it may be read from the replica and then stored in the cache. What's important here is the fact that the time to live in the cache is much longer than the lag related to replication. So if uh, it's in the cache, it, it has up-to-date data, and we are not reading from replica that can, may be still replicating, and if it's not there, then data is certainly not new, and we are safe to read from the, the replica because it should have already up-to-date data because a lot of time has passed. A different solution to this problem is the one from Facebook where supposedly, that's not confirmed, they, for example, redirect you to the master if you are the one that changed the data. So from your perspective, it's up-to-date, but Alice may not see the result immediately. When master fails, you just select a new master, so system stays consistent. When cache fails, you can either start reading from replicas directly, having the system no longer consistent but still available. It then starts being eventually consistent. Or you can try spinning off a new cache. The fifth stand, step is to ensure that after any failure, your system returns to a consistent state. So you could, for example, wait for Bob to fix it, meaning your system is no longer even eventually consistent because Bob may never return to our system. Or you can write a data restoration procedures that you run either daily or after a few requests or after a failure. Or you could think of smarter ways, for example, doing a system that could heal itself. A self-healing system is the one that discovers inconsistencies and is able to fix it them on his on its own. When usually somebody issues a code and I'm asking what happens if B fails, I see this as a result. Problem with this is that it's wrong for multiple of reasons, multitude of reasons. If B fails, then for example, database uh, connection has been broken and therefore rollback will not work because you will not be able to delete a bro uh, something from database when there is no connection. It may fail also because actually the server running this script has just died in the middle. So this does not make us self at all and please guys, avoid it. Your rollback procedure has to be a separate process. Uh, another use case we stomped on was created rush conditions. Uh, we were performing some operation here called capitalized A, and it might have failed due to rush conditions. If we did it like on the left, 
it might have been failing all the time and actually turning off the whole server because it would be going through this loop all, all the time. This would happen if it were failing for the reasons we didn't predict. So it's better just to try a few times minimizing risk and throw exception if we fail to do so after a few times. An example of this is where we had to design uh, each page uh, so that each user in the system has a page called name.surname, but it has to be unique, so we were adding a consecutive numbers to the end to make sure it's unique. We were using Mongo and Redis, and when user was registering, we first searched for a first free name, so first free number, then we tried storing it in Mongo. And when you are thinking about trying to store it and searching phases, so in phase one, you are searching for this name, in phase two, you are trying to store it, when you have a distributed system and multiple nodes can be performing this operation, it may easily happen that some other node will already take this name just before we did the second step. So the only source of truth here is Mongo, which may throw a unique exception upon us. And when it happens, we try once more, once more, once more, up to n times. If it failed after n times, we go with an error message. Finally, because those pages were really often used, we had to store it somewhere in something quicker than Mongo. We stored it in Redis. But what happens if the system dies or fails for some time, or Redis fails, uh, before we store it? And then we can think of an approach of a self-healing system. So when the username should be in Redis, because Redis is meant to hold all those usernames, uh, but uh, it's not there, we must not assume the user is not there. In such case, we will have to revert to the source of truth, to Mongo, to find out whether actually the user is not there. If he's not there, everything is fine, 404. And if he's there, we just apply our self-healing in the background, so we recreate his entry in Redis and provide valid result as if nothing happened. Remember that such situations, though, those edge cases have to be locked. Otherwise, you will may simply ninja hack your ninja code your system, not knowing you have serious problems there. Now, you can design a system that's consistent, at least consistent from the user perspective. Maybe not consistent internally. You may design a system that's at the same time available, that will become less strict, will become eventually consistent when there are failures or partitions. And if you are thinking of a system that's available under failures, you have to think of making sure you will eventually return to the consistent state, in other words, ensure that you are eventually consistent always. And CAP theorem with all the doubts it's giving is not forbidding this. CAP theorem works in a, let's say, very narrow uh, case. Also, CAP theorem seems to provide more confusion than benefits. And even 12 years after publishing CAP theorem, Bjur Brewer has written yet another paper explaining how he understands it. And what he says, apart from the short times when there's a partition discovery process within the system, your system can be available and can be consistent. In order to think of such systems, first of all, accept inconsistencies and be aware of them. Do not ignore them. Design for data that's not consistent and test against this data. And finally, ensure your system will return to consistent state eventually. No whether your parts, parts of your system are either available or consistent when there are failures. Thank you. Any questions?